Okay, uh, I think let, let's get started then. Yes. So, hello everyone, welcome back to the Architecture Weekly YouTube channel. And today we're speaking with Anton Malinsky, a co-founder of Marathon Labs and the author of the Marathon Test Runner framework. So today we're speaking about automated mobile testing and all that stuff that happens to, to be nuances there. So yeah, Anton, can you please give us a short introduction aside of what, what I've done already? Yeah, sure. So again, my name is Anton. Hey, everyone. Uh, yeah. So uh, besides uh, Marathon, I guess. Uh, um, so I worked before, like I have experience of around like maybe 15 years in software engineering. I worked in mobile. I worked in infrastructure. I worked in backends and a little bit of front end web. Um, yeah, so my, my journey is basically from mobile engineering into the infrastructure where I kind of generalized all my knowledge and uh, understood more about software engineering in general, not just the mobile specifics. Um, yeah, and kind of marathon is a, a result from that generalization where you, you start to see patterns, especially in automation testing, but not only that, uh, and you try to figure out a solution that works for uh, not just a single tech stack, um, yeah, so in terms of the uh, tech stacks, I guess my main one right now is Kotlin, a little bit of Golang, a little bit of Rust. Uh, yeah, that that's uh, like very basic intro. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. Uh, can you please tell me, like, uh, you mentioned the generalization, right? Uh, yeah. But what made you switch from, you know, typical product mobile development to this kind of, hey, I need to... To write a test runner like how it happens yeah so um i guess like part of it was business focused so when uh, um i was trying to basically scale up testing uh in one company that i worked for called agoda and it was uh, in thailand in bangkok um so the company was basically scaling up in terms of the number of employees but so that also meant that we were scaling up in terms of uh requirements i guess for verifications and at the same time infrastructure. So trying to run more verifications always requires some kind of cost, but uh, translating that cost into uh, infrastructure and basically time to signal for verification doesn't really work out of the box. So I guess uh, with Marathon, we actually tried first to fork several test runners that were available back then. Uh, you can probably like, I mean, like they for, like we started with Android that was kind of spoon. Uh, uh, Shazam uh, from, from Square, it was Shazam's fork. We tried, uh, I think, another one that I don't remember. So we tried to use all of them and try to modify it in terms of the software. And they didn't really fit nicely because of the way how they plan the text, test execution. In most of the tech stacks, the expectation is uh, you kind of connect a certain number of like execution units, devices, I mean, mobile phones or like uh, any kind of computer, EC2, whatever, VMs. And that's what you have. So the problem that we were seeing is that we wanted to dynamically scale those test runs. So you start with five devices and like, oh, it's not enough. I'm going to add you 10 more in the middle of the test run. Can you handle it? Most of the runners cannot do that. They're not reactive by nature. Nature. They don't really plan for a certain SLA, I guess, for trying to finish tests uh, in a certain amount of time. So we basically had to start from scratch. And that's where kind of the idea of uh, a more reactive and more predictive runner came from. Okay, okay. Um, so l let's uh, take a step back a little bit. So yes. uh, why do you need uh, something that is called test runner in the first place? Like, why can't you just you know, write a test, run it on a single device, and see that your functionality works properly and go ahead from there. Like, why do you need several devices? Yeah, um, I guess the first thing to probably to clarify is test runner is very ambiguous term. So uh, to unambiguate it, we have to be explicit that test runner is something that is or, uh, trying to coordinate the test run on one or more execution units. And by execution unit, I, I'm kind of generalizing again, it can be a mobile phone, it can be an emulator, simulator, or for backend, it can be like a container that tries to run a GVM, for example, if you're, run, you're running just regular GUnit tests, or it can be just a process in general for something like, I don't know, Rust or Go. Uh, so when trying to coordinate this execution, uh, 
most of the test runners, they work in a single process, okay? So like when they try to execute tests, they basically start up a single process. For example, on Android, that would be AM instrument that would kind of spin up an, a, 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 a test application that will try to coordinate this. But you need, when you try to scale this in when you reach a certain uh, kind of number of tests, or I, I guess more precisely, the time it takes for you to execute those tests. For example, uh, for uh, for Agoda that I mentioned before, that number was around like 25 hours. So if you were if you would try to execute all the tests that we wanted at that point in this kind of in one device, that would take us 25 hours. When you try to par parallelize these uh, tests on multiple devices, uh, you can kind of blindly throw it at each device, but you need to be uh, you need to understand that each test it it is different. So one one aspect of this is obviously the so there are certain tests that are super fast. There are certain tests that are that are longer. And uh, at first, you can think it's only kind of when you're looking at this, uh, kind of zooming out into like seconds. But it also makes uh, for a lot of uh, it makes a lot of sense when you go into like unit tests. Like this takes a test takes I don't know like one millisecond. This one is ten second. It's it's exactly the same regardless of this time scale. So something needs to coordinate coordinate this test execution, and the goal of it is trying to uh, like not to have anything that like in terms of execution units that doesn't do anything, if that makes sense. So if you have, for example, have like 50 devices in parallel, you want all of them to finish test execution exactly at the same time. Because if they don't, that means you have devices that you're not using. And that's cost that you're paying for using them, but you're not really utilizing them, if that makes sense. Well, yeah, it makes sense, but is is it really a problem that you you have devices that are not running tests? So, because um, is is it really a bottleneck to your software development process that your devices are not running tests? So if you are if you are at a scale where you have ten tests that you run and they finish on one device in like I don't know three minutes, then it's fine for you. I guess there is a there's a certain number of tests and verifications that you need to run to reach uh, to reach a conclusion that this is a problem for you because you might have a, like non optimal code in any software, right? You like the, the as soon as you try to run it faster, as soon as you try to run it like at, uh, with more instances, you start to see uh, things that did, weren't a bottleneck before. And for testing, this coordination is the bottleneck when you try to uh, just throw money at the problem, essentially. So by throwing money at the problem, I mean, I'm just going to buy, for example, I don't know, I'm on GCP, I'm going to just buy more VMs, and I'm just going to spin 100 of them. And I hope for the best, my tests are going to finish as soon as possible. Well, something needs to be smart enough in order to use all of those devices efficiently, because in the end, you're paying the cost for it. Like any, any And uh, when you pay it is usually at least when you're like doing a like a change set, I don't know, pull request to it, like GitHub or something like GitHub or merge request with GitHub, whatever is your okay. version control system. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so, so what, what you're saying is, first of all, we need a test runner because like the, the test set can be very long, like more, more than a, a day, more than 24 hours. So yeah. we need kind of a parallelization and then we need something to coordinate this parallelization. This is the first thing. But th th the next question that... Um, uh, I would come up with is why do you need the whole test run all the time? Because in a pull request, you, for example, you have a big application like a super app like Uber or Bolt or I don't know, uh, any, like a Grab or other super apps, right? So one team makes a change to a single module in the application. Do we still need to run the 25 hours test? Um, I guess this is a kind of more uh, kind of philosophy question. Uh, I guess I can kind of show two of them and like each uh, each person makes the choice of like which uh, which one is more applicable for you and for your particular circumstances. So uh, one case is you rerun everything. Uh, for a particular layer of the pyramid. So because tests are like, uh, they're, they're like unit tests or integration tests and system tests, I guess UI tests where Marathon started is at the top of the pyramid. And uh, like this is something a flaky by nature. So you don't really trust the fact that it's always going to be giving you a reliable signal. If you don't trust them in the first place, then you need to run them each and each time. Uh, second, if you if you wrote a software 
and tests our software, uh, why are you not using it for verifications? Like you're, we are writing testing code so that we can uh, be sure that everything still works. So uh, we can optimize this though. Like there are built systems like uh, Bazel and like, uh, I don't know, Please and et cetera, and X that are trying to understand more about the build graph and usually tests are in the build graph and be in as incremental as possible. So you can figure, sometimes this is called impact analysis, which is usually an augmentation of a build system that doesn't really understand this as a concept, that there are inputs and outputs and something can be cacheable and we don't need to repeat it. So tests are exactly that. If you can figure out that like none of your dependencies, including transitive ones, uh, haven't changed, then I don't need to rerun a test. This is actually a very hard problem unless you use a build tool that really understands this, uh, like the syntax tree and every like of everything you're using, not just the fact that uh, that's your that's your piece of code. Uh, it's also your third party dependencies. Like, do you need to verify something if, for example, your someone changed the shared code for? Uh, like uh, using canvas to draw a button i don't know probably yes if you're using if you really care about the ui uh, maybe you don't but like you need to make those decisions efficiently so uh the part a is like we don't want to run we want to run uh, all our verifications all the time and we can try to optimize it and then there is another kind of point of view at this where uh, we want to save cost right like we don't want to run them because we don't trust them and uh, they take a long time there's they cost a lot but i i feel like this point of view uh, personally is more motivated by the cost and not like not uh, willing to try to fix this so when you don't run a test uh, lots of times uh, then you don't understand how flaky it is in order for you to fix the flakiness you really need to measure it like if you are if you're afraid of running your tests and like you want to optimize them in terms of incrementality and cacheability uh, you don't really you can't really figure out if it's still working or not and Besides just like runs that are uh, like for each, for example, pull request, I would probably suggest even run them on every commit. Like that's a problem that can be solved. It's like by scaling the uh, dependencies that your tests require. And I guess mobile here stands out because the infrastructure for running those tests is a bit tricky to set up at scale. Um, in other tech stacks, like for example, for uh, for front end with web, we can, we kind of have tooling for trying to scale this up using something like Selenium Grid or something. Uh, so it, it's all a matter of tools that are available to you that can help you figure out the problem. But the direction, uh, from my perspective, is you need to run all your tests. You can do these optimizations, especially when you have a huge code base. For example, like if you go into Google, their monorepo, yeah, if you don't incrementally try to run all the tests, well, you're, you're going to have a bad time. There are no data centers that can, that can run all the tests for, for that kind of code base. But I probably uh, would estimate that only like less than 1% of companies are in this state. So your code base is still not big enough to to try to solve this as a problem. Um, let's talk about uh, the specific of mobile testing. So you said like for web, you can do like uh, 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 Selenium grid or for regular backend development, you can spin up as many virtual machines as you want to run your tests on. But uh, what what's happening with mobile? Uh, what are the caveats of scaling tests with mobile development? Mm -hmm. So I guess we uh, like probably it's worth saying like what is kind of the same uh, and what uh, what is different compared to I guess well any okay. kind of testing including backend and frontend uh, in terms of web frontend I guess uh, so things that are the same are you still have a lot of dependencies so when you run your test you still have API dependencies that you like you uh, maybe you are using like staging environment or maybe you're using like mock service that you spin up by mock it really usually means it's a stub service uh, but you have a lot of dependencies like binary and network available to you um, over the network so the, what's the same is usually again same patterns with like you set up your test environment you do something and then you assert that uh, uh, the result is like is expected um, there are also tests uh, that are the same, uh, which are non-binary. So these are tests that don't actually tell you that if it's if it's working or not. 
So these are the, uh, I put like screenshot testing and performance testing and any kind of anything that produces metrics or artifacts, but the, the judgment for what is the right, uh, the right state for a system is made separately from the test. Uh, some for screenshots, for example, this can be a, a separate person goes into like, oh, this test was executed and this is the, this is the uh, rendered layout that we have right now. Is this correct or not? Only a person can judge this uh, or at least the person can provide you with an expected value uh, why, why why only a person can judge this because uh, back then like 10 years ago i already saw the frameworks or tools that could compare the images and tell you that like uh, the images match like 99.9 percent .9 and uh, you can put a threshold where you like yeah screenshots matched it's all good let's go or there are uh, there, there are renders that um, can you know not not using the screenshot but they will try to render your component into an XML, right? And then com compare the the snapshot and the XML structure and say, hey, th those are the differences. And if there are no differences, then the test pass. So wh why it should be manual? Um, the manual part here is not really about the comparison. It's really about providing the expected value. So when you provide an expected value for the screenshot usually and most of the times you run the test once before you make a call that well okay this is now my expected value you put it as expected and then you say, then the next iteration can verify that nothing changed but the judgment for what is the desired state is done by a human uh, including performance, for example, you can you can convert this test to binaries and like uh, if there is a threshold for like only like a certain number of pixels changed, then it's fine. But it's a it's an approximation. So for uh, the same can be applied for performance testing. If my backend like uh, passes to the performance tests and assuming like VM is still the same, network is the same, and it does like for example two hundred requests per second, it can handle with a with a certain load parameters. And now it's only one hundred fifty. So so is this a passing test or is it a not is it not like someone makes the call on the what's the assertion in the in the kind of binary test the assertion is uh, done by like you really put a text thing like and you commit it to git which is i think a very important part of this in the flow like you commit the expectation into your source control because it's easy to express via text with these non-binary tests usually uh, the expectation is really just a blob of data and um, or maybe it's a table in csv i don't know like whatever is the format but it's not as easy to uh, express this in a way how we usually write tests um so yeah i guess besides those like uh tests uh, that are non-binary let's go into like things that are different so i guess the biggest one is the infrastructure requirements for running your tests uh for most other stacks you the only thing that you need is just some compute you don't really care about the fact which operating system it is unless you do and like in case of like front end and like oh i need to test on safari only but it's a separate question i guess like in general all you need is some virtual machine that's it uh with like linux kernel or windows whatever it is your requirement for uh for mobile what you need is a very is a very specific operating system that is usually spin up for android in an emulator or or for in case of iOS, it's a simulator, uh, or you test on an actual real device. So you can buy like a Linux kernel device right now, uh, like a lot of them uh, in like Amazon, Google, like or like Microsoft. yeah, yeah. Uh, right, right now, yeah, right now I'm sharing the screen with uh, with a mobile farm for yeah. Uber, and this guy like uh, Toi Smith is very very known in Android community. Right, and this is like what Uber has. It's like you know, the device is connected all over the place. There is special server rack for that, and uh, you 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 see how it's installed here, and all this infrastructure, the, the connectors, the chargers, uh, all uh, like the device is laid out in order to to test the, the mobile stuff. So it's like it doesn't look like the the bunch of virtual machines, right? So it's a completely different thing. 
Um, yeah, I guess this is when you want to test only on use, using real devices. So I, besides Marathon, I also supported the farm. I'm not sure what's the scale of uh, Uber uh, in terms of the like, number of devices that are available. So before that, I supported the farm around the 100 real Android devices, around several hundred depends because they were like uh, dynamically scaling for emulators around 80, 90 Mac minis and on each Mac mini around two, three simulators. So it's a kind of not thousands, like hundreds of devices. Uh, and it's a pain to support them. Uh, you really need very specialized knowledge. So you can think about this as like, I, you need to build your own cloud. Right, with very specific operating systems that you need to support there. So most of the tooling is going to be really custom tailored to you. There are some open source projects that help you there, uh, like OpenSTF, I think, is the biggest one uh, that now supports both Android and iOS devices, uh, which was supported by Hatspin, as far as I remember. Uh, but the, that was renamed now to Device Farmer. It doesn't matter. There is like a default kind of thing that you can start with, but it is nowhere near production level that is needed for your CI usually so you need to do a lot of uh, tweaking on like health checks and monitoring and alerting and for real devices that also means you really need to um, understand where devices can fail so most of the real, real devices have are not supposed to be used in a testing environment where it's like 24 7 someone is going to run tests on them so it's power requirements uh, where uh, you need to support a lot of uh, devices that need uh, roughly probably two amperes of uh, current. So like at least 10 watts like, and newer devices need even more. So for a hundred devices uh, that quickly scales to one kilowatt, that's a lot of power. And that also means you need to support, support uh, I don't know, ACs with active, active passive that need to cool this thing down. Uh, and some person needs to be alerted if some phone is getting over the threshold for a temperature and even if you do all that you still have the problem with batteries because the, the oh wait a batteries. second so 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 yeah. that's completely a whole new problem right so it's not yeah. only you you bought a uh, a bunch of wires and bunch of devices and connected them and uh, you know run some software to run tests on them it's like really hardware problems that arise when you're not using the phone just like one minute per hour or well, five minutes per hour during the the usage of like usual human but it's actually connected all the time to the charger and yes. it, it can get hot just because you're running tests with camera for example because my phone is like you're you're um, um you're getting a video for like 10 minutes and then it's really hot and you're like okay 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 wait a second uh, but now it's like uh, not only for single devices, 100 devices, and you need to monitor all of this. And the next thing is like the, the battery dies really fast, right? Because they're not supposed to be on the charger. What what would you do then? Well, I guess, so for some devices, even under full load, when you load the CPU fully, that's more applicable, I guess, to phones. You can't find the charger. I don't mean your charger that comes with your phone in the box. I mean, like a commercial charger that uh, really can get more than two amperes on the like five volt uh, charging that you have. I guess for USB-C, that may be a bit different. They, every manufacturer now chooses their own voltage that they want to support. Uh, but you can find the charging for most of the phones. For tablets though, because the screen is very, very big. And if you have those in your farm, uh, what we found previously was uh, the battery would drain whatever you do. So like after the tests are executed on the tablet, you really need to have a cooling off period where the battery really charges back. So it's, it's for, for something that is, well, it's really an input output system. You can only get, get so much current into, into a device. Uh, and this just shows you that these uh, kind of hardware devices are not supposed to be used in at scale uh, for verification. And that's kind of, I guess, my point here, where if you want to verify a particular device, that's okay. Like, but scaling with the hard, a real mobile farm is is not really possible at this point. The, the the reason is you can set it up, for example, with the latest phone right now. You will buy a hundred of them or two hundred of them, whatever is the number that you need, so that your tests pass as fast as possible for you. But a year later, you have a new phone, you have a new model, and your user base changes. 
So now you need to buy the new model and the old model is not really needed anymore for you because every app has different devices in terms of the most popular devices that are used for running your software. And this, we can think that Android is uh, the same. I guess for us, it's a little bit different where like at least it is like one single device per like what a year or something, but it, there's still this uh, kind of problem of you need to get more hardware all the time. And what do you do with the old devices? Uh, do you still run tests on them? But uh, with real devices, I guess the philosophy is uh, if it runs on this device, it means only it only can it it mostly runs on devices similar to, for example, like you're running on the way to Samsung and hope that the firmware is exactly the same. Uh, maybe it's not. Some companies do not really reuse code between devices, so it's just a new, completely new fork of uh, and uh, Android open source project, and it's just a completely different device. So there are no guarantees that that will work. And for scaling up, uh, when you really have a large code base, a lot of developers, and you really need to run as fast as possible, simulated or emulated solutions provide much better uh, characteristics where you, you just reuse the same surface. You just can you configure a new device, you use a new version of the, uh, for example, the operating system is supplied to using virtual hard disk drives, like for, I guess, uh, uh, Android mostly. Um, and yeah, you just update the software. It's a software problem for you, not a hardware one. And you reuse the same servers that you were using before. They can run the new versions fine. Um, but how, how reliable is uh, using the emulators to test the application instead of using yeah. the real devices? Because uh, because I imagine if you're doing just some business logic or networking, so sending the simple REST uh, request should work the same way on the devices and the emulators. But when you touch the camera topics or proximity or GPS or any other modern complex hardware that we have in our devices nowadays, like the emulator doesn't sound very compelling to me at least. Well, in theory, the interfaces from the operating system are exactly the same. I guess for camera, there is an old uh, camera v1 API that's probably not used anywhere right now. So you can kind of think that the interface for uh, using a particular functionality from a real device is the same. So you can simulate like GPS coordinates, you can simulate calls for like SMS if you want. You can uh, simulate a battery status or a network connectivity. All this can be done, but the tooling sometimes is missing. So you need to figure out how to do it for, a, for an emulator because uh, I'm, I guess this is, again, more of a software problem. Uh, the, in case of Android, Google doesn't, is not really interested, in my opinion, to, to provide you functionality to use this in an automated tests. You have this as a kind of UI thing. If you're running like on your personal uh, like uh, laptop or whatever, you're running the emulator, you have those buttons to like, oh, I need to change the rotation or I need to simulate that I'm on 3G connectivity with the latency. But from an automated test, sometimes the you don't have the tooling or APIs to even change this during runtime because ideally you want this to be like as a setup for every test. Like I want to set up my device so that I'm on like a very slow connection. I need to verify that my retry strategy still works, for example, with this latency or that I don't have a kind of screen that shows me all oh, connection not available. And then rather like still shows you, I don't know, a screen for the search or something, some of the search results. Um, I would still probably trust the emulator and simulator more and try to work on that because those so this this software uh, is the thing that we all share between all developers and infrastructures. Uh, we don't share real devices. So I would love to be in a state where we can share the same devices and scale, but that's not the case. So the it's a, it's also a question of investment. Like what do you invest in? Something that dies in one year or something that will continue to live on and like hopefully gets better in the future. Okay, okay. Uh, uh, are there any public trackers for Android emulator, for example, so that you can s submit requests and bugs and saying like, hey. Yeah, of course, the issue is google.com as far as I remember. Yeah, yeah but, but they, they no, like, nobody like, nobody is paying attention to those trackers. Like I remember submitting several issues there and there were like the, the threads across many years and saying like, hey, I bumped into the same problem, same problem, same problem, and like no attention from Google whatsoever. And they like just, I stopped doing that because why Why do you care if they don't care? So it looks like the, it should be like a major player, like Samsung or I don't know, like Huawei or wh whoever it, uh, it will be 
and you know putting the pressure of on on the on the emulator and saying like hey the quality of the mobile applications are really important like uh, there, there are some um some alliances like mobile alliance i i'm not sure like in many companies the trend that mobile native foundation yeah, yeah yeah for example so maybe them can go and say like hey we really think that this is a priority having the proper api having prog programming access for gps simulation or the network layer simulation and, you know I imagining having a unit test where you can say like this method goes with the low bandwidth um so several things i i'll probably answer here so one is if you like it's not that Google doesn't care. It's that this this doesn't really have any financial uh, reasoning, right, to fix this. And Android is well. That, that's the same. You. But that that's the same thing. It's like the, the reason why there is no attention. Like they, they don't pay attention because they don't know how to monetize this, right? Um, yes, but it's. It, Android is an open source project. As in any open source project, any person can fix this, right? So it's a question of like who uh, cares about it more so, so that this problem is at least patched or better actually has a real solution, right? So in the case of APIs, for example, uh, I this was a pain for me. And like I created a project that open sourced like things that you can use in your automated tasks for Android to do all of this stuff, as in like try to simulate uh, like rotations, network, and et cetera. Uh, it, the, for it to become something that everyone uses, like it's not just the fact that someone needs to fix a technical problem. It's also the question of like advocating for using a particular solution. And that's the problem with the open source development in general, and not really like the fact that there is a company behind Android. It could be any company behind Android open source project and it would still not be fixed. Because in the end, people do the work, right? Like someone needs to go and look at the problem and have time to fix this. So who is it going to be? In an open source project, usually it's pointing fingers. Or there is a volunteer who is like, uh, okay, I have time. It's so painful to me that I'm going to go and like fix this problem for me. And maybe I'm going to share a solution that maybe will work for someone else. But then you still okay. have like the scaling part, right? Like. Yeah. Uh, more use cases and eventually you're like you don't have enough uh, resources to support the solution and then the, 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 the yeah we, we are going to the valley of you know ranting about how the open source work and that that's yeah, not I the guess. topic to, today at yeah. least okay okay let, let's get back to the, the test yes. runner topics right yes. so by the way we have a couple of questions in the live stream mm -hmm. so one of the questions that i wanted to ask is like what are the major problems of APUM or Maestro test runners? Because I remember using uh, APUM, and the only problem that I would think about is uh, the, the flakiness and like no tooling whatsoever about handling those flakiness. So you, you had to write a framework on top of APUM that would, you know, rerun the tests, remember the results, and like, and, and all that stuff. So. Yeah, okay. Um, so Appium and the, the Maestro from Mobile Dev. Okay, so I guess the Appium story is more, I think, uh, is around trying to use a platform that's not really a web browser using the web driver. That's the start of the whole Appium tests. Uh, it now has more native integrations into the testing frameworks, but um, every time you try to bring an abstraction into your software, it has a cost. In case of testing, that cost means you don't really you don't really understand what you're doing. You're hoping that this abstraction provides enough controls to you. You're hoping that abstraction doesn't really bring you flakiness. And flakiness is just being non-deterministic. The more code you have, the less deterministic the system will be. So more abstractions usually means less like more flakiness by just by nature of uh, what we're doing. Um, and Appium can scale it this uh, the story with like trying to use it uh, in the enterprise world is much better than it was like five years ago but it still has limits so um i guess the biggest company i know that you like runs appium tests is around like three four thousand tests for the verification uh for a single platform um the the way how it works requires also investment on the infrastructure. It's not just bare tooling that is provided by Android and uh, iOS for running tests. Uh, you really need more, as in like this layer that translates what you're doing using like HTTP calls that translate into doing something on the actual 
fake DOM of your application. Like it's a, it's kind of, you have a screwdriver with a Phillips head and then you have a flat head and you're like, uh, well, the flat head works. I'm going to just use it on the Phillips head. Well, kind of up to a certain point. Uh, and some companies go through the, uh, through like through this pain and still succeed by writing custom code around this. And some companies just migrate to native. Uh, but in the current world, it's uh, about like, are you doing cross-platform uh, development for your mobile? Do you want to save the cost? So it has more, more surface on like, w which solution do you want to choose? Um, I guess for the Maestro, that thing is again, kind of uh, a thing that doesn't require you to code in a native way. It's a kind of no code solution for your tests uh, where you write some text sheet, uh, like text, uh, text definition of what you want to do in your test. And then this magically gets translated into a stable, reliable code with kind of close to zero flakiness. Well, there is no silver, silver bullet. So this, this kind of pattern to uh, not coding for writing an actually reliable code exists for a long time. And I can see this like every 10 years, there's going to be a new, new framework that's going to do this. It is a good place to start, but it's never a, a, a place that you want to be in when you want to run more and more tests. Uh, because someone needs to needs to change uh, pieces of code that, for example, even like press a button, like it can be very simple, but uh, like how does it actually do that? Like it's uh, there are different APIs that are available on the platform. So how do you like abstracting this brings more flakiness, and that's what companies that which are trying to kind of run more tests with frameworks like Appium and uh, I don't know that many with my Maestro to be fair, but I would expect that after a thousand tests, you're gonna feel the pain where I don't trust my and can we do a better job? And then it's going to be I wear the Go native, and uh, for Android that's uh, like Espresso with maybe some wrappers around it, and for iOS that's a like UI test, or even just a C test if you want to test like uh, something without the UI. Um, yeah, there is. Uh, I guess. So 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 the biggest problems of those frameworks is not mm -hmm. being native enough, right? Yes. So the yeah. using some some tools or. Yes, uh, those, those from the other world. Yeah, it's it's an abstraction that tries to uh, like one of them is an abstraction uh, like software, which is Appium. So it tries to provide a generic interface to like do something on the screen. That's cool. But uh, for for example, the biggest difference between Android and iOS UI testing is Android UI testing is white box, and the iOS testing is black box. So in Android, you can really call methods in your application. And sometimes you want to, for example, to set up an expectation or I don't know if you want to mock something. So for iOS, that's not the case. Trying to, so it, for Appium, that basically means that you're trying to unify two completely different approaches under the same interface. Can it be done? Yes. Is it a good idea? Well, questionable. Um, and the maestro is is not really about the interface. It's about like no code solution where you don't want to spend the effort on writing efficient and reliable code. And that's kind of in a separate bag for me uh, from the interfaces, right? You, you can think that the text description is an interface, but mm, yeah, that's a, a very big assumption. Yeah. So it looks to me, it, it all comes down to the reliability of running the test on the CI. Like if you if you can't really respect and trust the results of the CI CD, like everything doesn't matter actually, right? So you, you need yeah. this this trustworthiness of the pipeline in the first place, and then you can build up of that. Yes. And I, I think that's the key thing to understand when even writing tests. So I think from my personal experience and from the people who I'm working with in lots of different companies, I think we have this assumption that like we have production code and we have the testing code. So we care yeah. about production code. It should be perfect, like patterns, like design patterns and like abstractions. Yeah, we think about every every symbol. When you go into testing, ah, I'm just going to write it like as simple as possible. So this just shows to you that like tests should be as reliable as possible so that you can trust this code. It's nothing more. It's just the same code written in a different way. But you need to invest into writing this in the most uh, kind of, the best possible way you can afford, right? Uh, I think the kind of canonical example for me in terms of kind of this is production code, this is testing code is SQLite, like a very small library. Yeah, yeah. Right? They're, they're, they're crazy. They're like 10 times more tests than the actual production code. 100 times more. 
100 times more. So but... I think the I think SQLite is like around a thousand lines of C code, and they have more than hundred thousand lines of code for testing this. So th this just. But that, that's you... a that, that's a such a great product. Like I, I haven't had a single issue with SQLite for for like fifteen years. It, it is so amazing. Like very simple, super fast, very reliable. By the way, maybe this is one of the reasons that uh, uh, Android actually comes with the SQLite, right? So all all this internal database you're you're dealing with in your applications is SQLite. So <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very good reference piece of software that that is very hard to tell someone from the product. Someone's going to ask you what's the estimation <laughs> for doing this feature. I well, I can I can imagine a product for SQLite going just just crazy like. Hey, what are you doing? You're not adding features. I need more features. Um, yeah, this is psychology, right? Like this is psychology for saying that, like, uh, I need to care about my this this code that doesn't go to production that my users do not really see, but it's still very important to me. Uh, and that's where kind of reliability is rooted here, where like the more the more native code you're writing, the more you understand about the real system you're using. And the more you abstract from it, the more details are going kind of through your fingers. You can still kind of patch all of these things. And uh, you can see this, this, the same pattern is like for Flutter and for kind of React Native, where you have the developers for on the native stack, and then someone's providing you bindings as in the interfaces that for some reason are needed right now. Um, but I think the answer here is like, you really need to care about top to bottom. What's your stack? What are you actually using? Um, yeah. Um, in terms of things that are different between like we, I think we started this with the things that are different between kind of backend testing and front end and mobile. There's also the difference on uh, how you access the devices in general as in this compute for most of the, um, most of the backend, you probably started just using shell uh, commanders, which means basically process around the kernel, right? For Android, there, there are like wrappers for accessing the device, which is like ADB. Uh, it's a like low level, not really strictly protocol specific, uh, like it doesn't really have a good protocol. It's kind of a, an assembly of all the different things that uh, Android open source kind of evolved with, uh, different patches for different parts of the Android operating system that you might care about. And for Apple, that's even, even worse where it's, uh, Mm, anything that Apple gives you, essentially. So you're at the mercy of a tech giant, which you cannot influence. Some of it is closed source and uh, very hard to work around. And if something is not there, well, you can't really change anything. Uh, with Android, at least you can look on the sources and maybe patch it, maybe add some, some functionality, create a fork. For example, ADB was forked, I remember, years ago by Facebook with their own functionality that they used. So, but that wouldn't be possible. How, how do how do they do that? Like, uh, I, I'm not sure I know how ADB works under the hood. So, um, I think I have a separate uh, separate discussion around all of this around two hours in depth, oh. I, and there is an article on Medium around AD, ADB that I wrote. If anyone's interested. But, okay, okay, um, okay. So I expect the links later. So you you will sure. be able to find the links like down below. Maybe if I don't forget them, them this time. <laughs> <laughs> or nag me if uh, if we forget about this. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Um, in so ADB is a TCP uh, based uh, protocol with every request coming. Like they have a, this architecture where you're essentially having a multiplexer server on your lo local machine, and every device is connecting to this uh, multiplexer using different protocols, which of which are one USB obviously for physical devices, and there is TCP for local emulators and the remote devices that you connect to using AD, if you're using ADB Connect. So like nowadays, you also have this option for like pairing your device with ADB server on your machine, assuming you are in the same Wi-Fi, for example, same TCP there. And all, all, all this thing is doing is like it's accepting a request. It's binary. There are no specifications for protocols. So the way how I understood this was go and read the C code. That That's the only way. There are, there are close to zero comments there. So really, really kind of, uh, you're doing reverse engineering on the source code. I guess that's not reverse engineering, but you're still kind of figuring out how it works based on the source code. And uh, 
in you can kind of read on the part uh, how you talk to the ADB server, which is this multiplexer uh, in the Java implementation of this protocol from Google called DDM Leap. Uh, it's not perfect, but you can maybe if you read Java better, then that's that's a read material for you. But on the protocol from the server to the actual device, everything there is encrypted, and you can only read it in the C code. Like there's nothing else that implements this. I think the company behind Maestro, they were trying to do kind of remove this multiplexer, but uh, that's uh, they only support like several requests out of the box because there is encryption there, and it's quite hard for you to do and to end kind of like I'm a client, I go directly to a device. Uh, the reference implementation for Android is still using the server. Uh, well, another, another problem, with it, like if you want to have some custom implementation, you need the implementation on the device, right? So like the, this yes. ADV server on the device, uh, it should so know that this particular comment um, kind of implements, for example, I want to make a screenshot. It, it should be there somewhere. So you, you can just improve the client side. That That's not yes. going to work. Um, you can with custom firmware if you want to deploy that. Oh, yeah, yeah, of course, of course. Like, if you change the firmware, of course, you're already in functionality. But without that, like, uh, you're limited um, to what is shipped. Um, you can still augment this. Uh, so you can run any shell commands if you really want them. And nowadays, uh, for Android specifically, you can go directly to the binder uh, and ask services that are running on the device for uh, processing your request. So they were trying to kind of to save time for spinning up a process using shell and go directly to the service. So you can write a system service if you can deploy it, I guess. Well, you can deploy it for, for like original firmware. So shell commands are the only thing that are available to you if you can't modify the firmware yeah, as, a, as an extension point okay yeah as an extension point you, you can deploy a binary you can it's like any c code compiled to like a target architecture um like whatever it is arm yeah. 64 okay. or um, 8 yeah okay um, okay let, let, let's get to the point like uh, we uh, we mentioned several times that um the flakiness of the test and this unreliability is uh, the biggest problem but we never touched the topic why the tests are flaky so like uh, the the most UI tests are like wait for the screen, find the copy on the screen, press the button, and ensure the dialogue appeared with with the, with another copy. Why the tests become flaky? So what what's breaking in this whole process? Yeah. Um, so if if to some like a very short summary of why is the complexity of this everything that's happening behind uh, asserting something or like interacting with your UI. So this complexity is what leads to like kind of non-deterministic behavior where uh, an example of this, you press a button on the search and then some API is going to respond to you with a request, but uh, your API that responds to this is actually not on your device. It's over the TCP IP somewhere in your AWS infrastructure. And for some reason, one of the switches decided that the packet is actually not going to be back. And then you have to retransmit the TCP packet again. And then, oh, it takes longer. And you have the logic for, oh, if it takes less longer than like, 10 seconds, then we're going to just say no, no request, no connection available. So this is an example of how the system is complex in terms of dependencies. Uh, some of them are related to stuff around like using network for talking to your dependencies. Some of it is really around uh, just flaky code that you write that is non-deterministic for like, rendering a screen. Uh, the an, an example of this uh, is a race condition. For example, you check if if a certain state is, exists on your in your application, and depending on the state, you change you change the, what you're what you're uh, kind of doing on the canvas. Uh, well, if you properly synchronize everything using state machines, then it will work. But rarely you can see people who are synchronizing everything everything behind the UI layer, and that goes into kind of like how do we architect everything and synchronize those like flux architectures with a single event flow depends how you write the code so and it, it, it all uh, goes into complexity like if you have a very simple thing one single thread that like main main thread and that's the only thing that you have sure everything will work probably reliable but we don't have well, well, wait wait a second wait a second so i i totally get into the point like when you're doing the network request and the, all all the uncertainty of the world will will punch you in the face that that's fine that's understandable 
But what about an application that is not going to make any network requests? For example, like you, you run the application and it's just a wizard that is showing you, you know, the introduction, how to use the app basically. Yeah. And still then you can face the situations when like you see, you got them see the, the label or the button on the screen, yeah. but in the same particular moment, the test that you're running is not able to see it. Like some how the hell? Yeah, so some of these interactions uh, depend on like how much processing time your application uh, takes, right? So like in order for you to, to paint anything, you need CPU cycles. So the first thing you have to understand about anything we're using right now, and I guess like majority of devices is like the CPU might not be available to you. Something else might be just overloading your device. And in case of mobile, this is also possible and more prominent because you don't really have a lot of resources there. So uh, you can see, for example, an emulator that you start up on your probably super beefy machine and like uh, it, you start it up and then it's just slow. You you click on any button and it's like, yeah, it takes like five seconds for me to do anything. So imagine you have a test that is clicking on something and asserting that in three th seconds you're seeing the result. Well, very easy like it's not no, really not easy. really not really and if you if you start increasing the timeouts then the test becoming very slow and you're not happy yes. again yes well but this is a problem of like how much resources are you spending on the actual code that you need like if we had an operating system that that wasn't really kind of multi uh, multitasking between everything that needs to be done the only thing running is your thing and you have only a single thread of execution this wouldn't be a problem the problem uh, it is a problem because we have concurrency and not just inside like inside your application so inside your application you can also do lo lots of things where like a thread doesn't get doesn't get resources maybe you exhaust like a thread pool executor and sorry you're going to wait until everything's ready same thing is applicable on the operating system level. Sorry, you just don't have the cycles to do any verifications. And when you're doing them, the state is not as what you expect. And you're not really, it's not really about network anymore. Okay, okay. Now I understand it. Thank you. Okay, but um, look, you're author of the Motherfront Test Runner, right? Yes, and yes. Th this thing is kind of supposed to solve those problems. Like well, what, guess... what, strat what, what strategies do you put in place to, to tackle those issues? Oh my God! We... Test, right? Uh, uh, I lost you for like fifteen oh, seconds. Sorry. Can you can you repeat? Sorry. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so for fixing non-deterministic code, which can be flaky production or flaky test code, the real solution is only to write the code in a way where it handles all of this non-determinism, as in like really synchronize your state, uh, really figure out the order of execution on multiple threads, and like provide all like we use good architecture, but. To patch this and get like, it really takes time to fix all of this, right? Like, so for example, imagine you have a team of developers, they're responsible for this part of the code base, and now you need to quickly fix this because your tests are flaky on your CI. Well, practically, you need some buffer to fix those, right? You need like a two weeks to figure out what's the problem. Like, you do like several days investigation, then you need to apply a fix, maybe change the architecture. Who knows? You need, you need the time to fix this. And what Test Runner can give you is a, a, a tools to patch the problem right now, kind of throw money at this and do retries. So the way uh, retries work is not just kind of post factum. So uh, for Marathon, there are three types of retries that are available. So the simplest one that you can usually see in kind of any test runner, usually, uh, uh, lots of usually here, um, for retries, like when the test fails, it's going to be scheduled for execution again, right? And then like if one out of N passes, then we consider this test passing. So what Marathon is doing is it has analytics behind so it figure it already has statistics for like a duration of time. Like for example, you were running this test for a month, and it can figure out. So for the last three days, this test actually has a very low probability of passing. Let's say zero point five, uh, and it can add the retries in parallel before it even sees the failure of a particular. Concurrent retries. 
and you get the signal faster. So if you're, for, what's the difference, right? If your test is one minute, if you're, if you're using regular retries, uh, let's say you're doing up to two retries. So it's gonna take you three, three minutes to figure out that the test is wrong. If you do this prediction logic that is implemented in Marathon uh, using statistics, then you can schedule those retries and it's still gonna take you one minute. So it doesn't affect your time to signal. It does affect your cost because you still need to kind of run the retry somewhere, but at least the time to signal for you stays the same and so, so, so the, the, the retries are run on the parallel devices yes okay so you basically save time on the cost of the of the hardware but you're providing the the, the proper signal Yes, and provide, you can provide the proper signal in the case of like you expect the test to be passing. If one out of uh, n retries is enough logic for you to say uh, that this is okay for us. But Marathon also gives you different ways to fix flakiness because when you want to fix flakiness, uh, it is really hard when you get to this like 0 0.9 uh, to 1 probability because you need to run the test a lot of times to figure out how how much better did I actually make this test in terms of reliability? Like, for example, to like you need to run this hundred times, thousand times. You, most of the test runners don't have this as functionality. So Marathon gives you kind of ability to uh, have the separate flow. For example, someone marked this test as a, a flaky, Marathon automatically handles this. So you don't really need to put any signals. It automatically has statistics about like, so this test is becoming flaky. You can look at dashboards separately and like alert the teams and owners about this. But when the team wants to fix this, it has a different mode where it you can use it to verify that someone actually fixed the problem. Because in a lot of cases, when someone fixes the flake and it's like, hmm, so I changed this API to a different one. I think it's better on my machine. And then you go into pull request and like, yeah, probably it's better. Let's let's. Oh. Oh, yeah, it's it's, it's all it's all a guessing game it's like yes, i changed the line of code let's try again it's like another cycle uh, so uh, what what do you mean by fixing the flakiness it's like increasing the probability of for passing the test from i don't know 0 0.5 to like 0 0.9 it, so it it's like in, in how you you define this, right? So Marathon can run as many retries as possible with the fail fast mode. So let's say that you expect the test to be like passing in uh, 500 retries. It's going to schedule it as, again parallel on all the different devices that you have. It's not going to take a long time, assuming you have hardware to run this. And you can see that, oh, 500 of them passed uh, when, when they're on. Okay, this is probably good enough for me in terms of the signal, because what it tells you is it's probably the probability of passing is somewhere be like between 0 0.39s and 1. So is that enough confidence for you? Depends. You can set it up. Flakiness depends on how bad it is for you in general, right? If all your tests are flaky, well, you're probably going to spend some time to fix all of them, and it might take longer. Um, and at the same time, you can just throw money at the problem, run the, run the concurrent retries that do not influence your time to signal. So your runs do not become longer, uh, but you're still going to pay the cost. And at some point when you scale, this is going to become an issue. So you can't just throw money at the problem. You can't run like 100 retries for every test, right? Uh, your, your teams need to understand how how much of a problem is flakiness at this point. And that's what Marathon gives you so like as, a, as kind of metrics, right? You can look on the metrics and see which tests are actually the most flakiest ones out of all that we were running. And it's independent of the, te of the tech stack. So it's for Android and iOS currently, and there is more support coming for different ones, like not okay. just mobile. Okay, cool. Uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. So I, I would love to continue this discussion. Maybe, maybe next time we'll talk about like the internals of adb or something like that oh, yeah, sure. yeah but uh, this time thank you very much anton that was very insightful for me like the nature of flakiness is, uh, is really great uh so i will try to include all the links uh, down below uh, under the description when anton sends me the links to, to his articles about adb and you know marathon and all that stuff so thank you very much and uh, next time what we're having we're having mikhail Druzhinian. Uh, speaking about disaster recovery. So I'm really looking forward to that. So see you really soon. Thank you very much.